Well, well, good evening out there, Cicada Solvers, and welcome to another Cicada 331 live stream where we're going to go through the latest that the solving group has discovered. <clears throat> so let's start out here with the latest Emergence 2 Tempest. And as always, these Sophia Music videos are riddled with hidden symbols and things of that nature. So if you decipher anything that you found hidden in the music video, always like drop it, let me know what you found, or put it into the Discord. Um, the Discord link is there in the description box if anyone wants to join and become one of the solvers. So... <clears throat> The solver team in Cicada 33 on Discord has stumbled upon something other solvers missed. The painting used in the first 2012 puzzle has Christ in the boat and the painting inspired by a poem by Alfred Tennyson written in 1832 may hold more clues. In the poem, Tennyson writes, Four gray walls and four gray towers overlook a space of flowers in the silent isle and bowers. It is interesting to think that Cicada asks us to do four re unreasonable things every day. Some solvers think it relates to the four winds of the earth, which every sailor knows. Winds are unreasonable. They s cause squalls and hurricanes, cyclones and tornadoes. Mother Nature is chaotic. Lady Shallot is an interesting persona, and her myth is seeped deeply in the legend of King Arthur. So if you take a look at here, the Lady of Shalott. <clears throat> the Lady of Shalott is a lyrical ballad of the 19th century English poet Alfred Tennyson in one of his best known works, inspired by the 13th century Italian short prose text Donna di Scalata. The poem tells the tragic story of Alain de of Astolat a young noblewoman stranded in a tower up the river from Camelot. Tennyson wrote two versions of the poem, one published in 1833 of 20 stanzas, the other in 1842 of 19 stanzas, and returned to the story in Lancelot and Elaine. The vivid medieval romanticism and enigmatic symbolism of the Lady of Shalott inspired many painters, especially the pre-Raphaelites, and followers, as well as other authors and artists. And this goes back into other works that Tennyson worked on, such as Sir Galahad, the poem recasts, uh, recasts Arthurian subject matter loosely based on medieval sources. The first four stanzas of the 1842 second version of the poem describe a pastoral setting. The Lady of Shallot lives in an island castle in a river which flows to Camelot, but the local farmers know little about her. And by the moon the reaper wary, plying shives in uplands airy, listening whispers, tis the fairy, Lady of Shallot. The legend is based on a woman named Elaine who dies of unrequited love for the King Sir Lancelot. Sorry, the Knight Sir Lancelot. <clears throat> who must fulfill his mission, but in some legends, Elaine and Lancelot live happily ever after. The idea of Elaine slowly freezing to death as she rides down a haunted river is riveting. Lane of Ascalot, another variant of the name, is a figure in Arthurian legend. She's a lady from the castle of Ascalot who dies of unrequited love for Sir Lancelot. Well-known versions of her story appear in Sir Thomas Mallory's 1485 book, Le Morte de Arthur Alfred, Tennyson's mid-19th century, Idyllus of the King, and Tennyson's poem, The Lady of Shalott. She should not be confused with Elaine of Corbinic, the mother of Galahad by Lancelot. The possible origin of version of the story appeared in the 13th century French prose romance Mort Artu, in which the Lady of Ascalot 
drifts down a river to Camelot in a boat after dying of unrequented love. Interesting, one of the things that has come up. So I posted in there in the Cicada Discord was Code Breakers Discover and Decipher Long Lost Letters by Mary, Queen of Scots. So I thought this was really interesting. Um, obviously, whenever there's a new type of encryption, this is always interesting stuff. Over the course of her 19 years in that captivity, Mary, Queen of Scots, wrote thousands of letters to ambassadors, government officials, fellow monarchs, and conspirators alike. Most of these missiles had the same underlying goal, securing the uh, deposed Scottish Queen's freedom. After losing her throne in 1567, Mary had fled to England, hoping to find refuge at her cousin Elizabeth's court. Mary's paternal grandmother, Margaret Tudor, was the sister of Elizabeth's father, Henry VIII. Instead, the English Queen imprisoned Mary, keeping her under house arrest for nearly two decades before ordering her execution. Mary's letters long fascinated scholars and the public, providing a glimpse into her relentless efforts to secure her release. The former queen's correspondence often raises more questions than it answers, in part because Mary took uh, extensive steps to hide her messages from the prying eyes of Elizabeth's spies. In addition to folding pages with a technique known as letter locking, she employed ciphers and codes of varying complexi uh, uh, complexity. Sorry. More than 400 years after Mary's death, a chance discovery by a trio of code breakers offering new insights into the Queen's final years. As the researchers write in the journal Cryptologia, they originally decided to examine a cache of coded notes housed at the National Library of France as part of a broader push to locate, digitize, transcribe, decipher, and analyze historic ciphers. Those pages turned out to be 57 of Mary's encrypted letters, the majority of which were sent to Michael de Castanel, a French ambassador to England between 1578 and 1584. All but seven were previously thought to be lost. Interspersed with a collection of 16th century Italian papers, the documents were written in mysterious symbols that offered no clues as to their sender, recipients, or date. Lead author George Lazary, a computer scientist and cryptographer based in Israel, told Smithsonian Magazine it was only when scholars spotted the word Walsingham, the last name of Elizabeth's spymaster, Francis Walsingham, that they realized the letter's significance. <clears throat> Fifty year, uh, so fifty year new to her uh, historians and the real gold mine for them says Lazary in total the letters contain 50,000 words of deciphered material you can see and these look a lot like you know the type of stuff that you find in the cicada puzzles right Codes involve substitutions and specific symbols standing in for letters, numbers, or words. Ciphers are more complex, using algorithms to transform messages into seemingly random strings of symbols. Mary's letters fall under the second category. Starting from scratch, the hill climbing algorithm managed to decrypt about 30% of the original text, but the remaining 70% had to be deciphered by hand, using a process somewhat analogous to solving a large crossword puzzle. According to the study, the encryption turned out to be a homophonic cipher, in which each letter of the alphabet can be encoded in several different ways. Mary also used a number of dedicated symbols representing commonly cited words and people. The elongated H, for example, denoted the Earl of Shrewsbury, an English nobleman who served with the Queen's custodian during her time in captivity. So it's called a homophonic cipher.
It would seem that the leak from the embassy was quite effective and comprehensive. The authors write in the paper. So you can see how it works. Pretty interesting stuff. Here we have art decodes. Our new Cicada 3 through 1 Renaissance art includes some Easter eggs, care to decode. Uh, and some people obviously did down here. The runes are, you know, those words there. If you look really closely in the, uh, the brow area, like above the forehead, there is uh, different like runes in the uh, clothing there, right? So a little AI art made by Anna Cooper with a little bit of encrypted codes in it. And then someone put out this, Cicada 3301 confirmed.
So as you can see there, there's quite a lot in that video, obviously. So if you want to like... It's everything you wish for. You can find like some different hidden things in there and whatnot, but very interesting. And a lot of that stuff we've seen like repeated in the cicada stuff that we've covered over the years. Runes were just advanced as Roman alphabet writing, says researchers. So you know how all the Liber Primus is written in runes? They're now saying that those runes were just as advanced as Roman alphabet writing. So a lot of people assume that the runes were like an older culture and yada yada yada, not as advanced as Roman writing. But no, they were more advanced or as advanced at least. Runes are no more oral than other inscriptions. Assumptions that runes represent a more oral tradition is based on the idea that rural, <coughs> runic inscriptions are contextually bound and are very uh, and are rarely in Latin, which is associated with a scholarly culture. But Old Norse can also be written and is not written in any worse just because it is the vernacular, says Bolaert. So if you take a look here, there's an interesting post here by Ayana Miller on the archetypal dodecahedron. The pentagram has always been prominent in magic and apparently owes its position to the Pythagoreans who called it health and used it as a symbol of recognition of members of the brotherhood. It seems that it owed its properties of the fact that the dodecahedron has pentagons, sorry, pentagons for its faces, and in some sense a symbol of the universe. Bertrand Russell, A History of Western Philosophy. <clears throat> to know the meaning of life, we have to explore the meaning of our own life, our interpretation of our particular reality. Interpretation is a supportive technique for ordering the cosmos. Everything has a pattern, including the core patterns of creation. If there are right angles, are there wrong angles as well? Is our topology of space inherent or imposed from our inconnective relationship of self, world, and cosmos? What is the nature of being seen from within? Mathematical solids are interesting facts, but also carry a host of mythic associations valuable to the soul which embody deep meaning and the geometry of the imagination coded hypercognition and cosmic consciousness what's inside the mirror of reflective experience the intersection of imaginal and deep memory expanded contracted and dissociative states Plato decreed, let no one uh, destitute of geometry enter my doors. In Timaeus, Plato describes how triangles made up five solids we call the platonic solids. Now these solids make up the four elements in heaven or firmament. These solids were central to Plato's vision of the physical world that links ideal to real and microcosm to macrocosm. These mathematic forms had a great deal to do with the crystallization of esoteric doctrines and tradition. You can see here, this is a medieval astrolabe. And you're like, well, what is a medieval astrolabe? An astrolabe 
is an ancient astronomical instrument that was a handheld model of the universe. Its various functions also make it an elaborate inclometer, an analog circulation device capable of working out several kinds of problems in astronomy. In its simplest form, it's a metal disc with a pattern of wires, cutouts, and perforations that allow a user to calculate astronomical positions precisely. That's a way to, you know, map out the heavens. See here, this goes back to light and sound, which is one of those things we've talked about a lot over the year or so that we've been covering this, which is how <clears throat> light is the same thing as sound. So like you can make sound make light, etc. And sound can be classified as light and, the, and vice versa. When light is sound and sound is light, I count many waves, the music just right. And here's the image. Then branch uh, wrote this in the discord the only way out is in you know more than you'll understand you'll understand more than you know let the wind howl through your soul let the wind scatter the seeds you sow beheld mckezeldick without mother without father without genealogy <clears throat> so, sorry, just trying to pull this up right here. So, Aurigia is a constellation. Riga is a constellation in the northern celestial hemisphere. It's one of the 88 modern constellations. It was among 48 constellations listed by the second astronomer Ptolemy. Its name is Latin for the char charioteer, associating it with various mythological beings, including Erictonius and Myrdalus. Ariga is the most prominent during winter evenings in the northern hemisphere as there are five other constellations that are stars in the winter hexagon asterism. one this was but then here is emergence six to end the show tonight so ideally look for things hidden in this video that might lead us more clues because all these things are just riddled with clues and things. Obviously what we've talked about tonight is most likely to return something. So 
So here is Emergent 6, Meraki official.